the types of resources that we're bringing to the table, the quality of the guests, right, that are speaking on these topics. These are our experts, our community experts. These are the folks that I want to work with. These are the folks that have really been the standouts in their respective industries that are able to continuously deliver on their promise of what their service is. And, you know, as a business owner, right, and as a as a caregiver and a care provider, our promise is the most important thing that we have. And, you know, when we can actually deliver on that and provide that, uh, execute on that for that patient, for that client, that's when we have uh, success. So my service goes hand in hand uh, with what Laura Lee does, and she's going to really get into into the details with with you guys. So I want to waste no more time and and introduce uh, Laura Lee. As I said, she is a um, valuable member of my extended team for PT and OT. Almost all of my clients, when they come home from a hospitalization, I am recommending that they get in touch with. Laura Leaf to continue their in-home rehabilitation. I know that when my clients come home with in-home rehabilitation, we reduce, we significantly reduce our readmission risks, right? We significantly reduce the possibility that that person's gonna go back for a hospitalization. Not only that, but it's additional support and we're setting them up for success. That is super critical uh, for my clients um, and that's part of what I think about uh, every day when we're, we're when we're doing our intake. So I'm really excited that that Laura Lee is joining us today, you know, and not only just because of what she does at Fox, as, as I said, you know, being an entrepreneur, being the president of LATIP, right? There's a lot of value that Laura Lee can bring to the health and wellness committee. And I am just thrilled that she uh, is able to uh, talk with us today. So without any further ado, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Laura Lee. Laura Lee, welcome. And uh, whenever you're ready, you can take it away. Sure. Thank you so much, Howard. Um, as you were speaking, I'm going to echo some of those sentiments, but you you went into it. I said, I wrote down, we can only go so far alone. And I wrote, I, I never want to be the smartest person in the room. So for me, um, connection and networking, it is a very important part of my life, regardless of what I'm working on at the moment. Um, it happens to be a very exciting space for me right now because I am an occupational therapist by trade, but I get to serve Monmouth County, which obviously goes hand in hand with this chamber. Um, I just a little bit about me. I grew up in uh, Marlboro, New Jersey after moving here when I was four from Florida. Uh, my parents are still in that same home. I currently live in North Howell, but I've lived in Tinton Falls. I went to Rutgers for undergrad um, and got my master's at Kane. So definitely a New Jersey girl, um, but I know Mammoth through and through. And I am, um, I'll, I'll share my screen just so I get to it, but I am the um, Mammoth County account manager for Fox Rehabilitation. So I'm your access point, anybody in Monmouth, but we do serve all over and I'll get into that. Uh, I just wanted to, again, express my gratitude for Howard uh, when he mentioned, I think we all know that it takes work um, when you want to uh, create something and he's one that has vision. We're all probably on this call because of it. Um, and as soon as he said there's a health and wellness component of the chamber, I jumped up because I said, you know, I might not have all this space to show up all the time, but that's a designated area which I'd love to learn more. Um, I really value professional partners uh, in this space. I have about 60 clinicians that I'm responsible for building their caseload across Monmouth. So when I can give them someone of value, like all of you on this call, yes, it makes me shine, but it it speaks to the value of who a Fox clinician and Fox individual is. So let me just make sure I can share. Um, Howard, just let me know if we're good on my end. You are. Okay, very just good. Just go into presentation mode. There you go. Perfect. Good? Yep. Okay. 
All right. So that was a little bit about me. Um, obviously, my contact stuff I'll throw up in there, but you can always get in touch with me um, on any social media link or anything else. I want. I figured the best way to start off is by showing you what we do as a practice, and then I'll speak to the referral indicators, indicators in general for physical, occupational, and speech therapy, just so you can have your eyes and your ears open to anyone that might need something. Maybe it's you yourself or a loved one um, that might come in, you know, things happen every single day and it's never always what you expect. So I tried to share a couple different testimonials, but this is George. Um, and yes, he's 101 and he makes me want to live to 101 and I hope he does for you as well. Hang on. Oh, sorry. I don't know why it's uh, the screen is split. But... Yeah, we don't hear hey. it and we don't um, see it. You can't hear it? No. Oh, no. Well, hold on. Did you look at your audio settings? No, they're on. But we see George 101 success story. We see that. Oh, it's not coming up. Okay, hold on. That's all you see? Yeah. I'm sorry, guys. You don't see him at all on YouTube. I'm just going to describe what he's doing then, and I'll get out of this for you. Um, you might just be sharing the one screen. You want to try one more time to share? I will, just because honestly, I think it's beneficial for you. Yeah, give it a shot. Um, not really about my, hold on. Yeah, just make sure you're sharing the screen that you want to share. You still see just him? We just see the text. All right, try it one more time. Okay, yeah. now we see the video, but I don't think we're hearing it. You may have to adjust your. Uh, uh, you may have to adjust the audio. I don't want to waste your time. It's, I think it is the same. If you change your microphone to same as system, see if that try. You can just try that. I had this problem once before. Did you? <laughs> same as system. Got it. I'll try it. I don't know if that's the solution. But what are you say, seeing now? You see George again? One on one. No, you had. Go ahead. Click the link. And let's see if we hear it. Nope. No sound. No. Well, now I'm not seeing the video though. We saw it before. Nothing. Nothing. Nine. Oh. Nothing. All right, there he is. There he is. It just came for me. A fall requiring surgery and rehab. Okay, I can hear it now as well. Okay. His deficits include hip pain, lower extremity weakness, impaired static balance, and decreased endurance. I plan to address these deficits in order to improve his independence and quality of life. A goal was to be in good shape at your next birthday. Not far away. I don't feel her baby. So we're halfway through treatment and George is making good progress. Balance is improving, endurance is improving, and he has less pain. His static balance has improved, allowing him to be challenged with dynamic balance activities. His pain is decreasing, his stamina has improved, allowing for a safe progression of walking distance. I can do more and more every day. That was the first time we walked four laps. Yeah. Now he's able to get up from a chair and do most things without pain. His leg strength is improving, which enables him to get up from a chair with less assistance. <laughs> Throughout the course of care, George has achieved his original strength goal with the five times sit to stand test. This has allowed us to progress to the Kazuka 10 times sit to stand test. There are no normative values for the 100 year old age group. So we are comparing him to the 80 year old age group. He's also requiring less assistance for transfers and gait, 
He is walking farther and his pain has resolved. Accomplishing these goals has allowed George to safely partake in lunch outings and even return to the dance floor. Why the whole neighborhood was dancing. I do dance on her. <laughs> it don't hurt. <laughs> With his accomplishments, George has become more functionally independent. He can't wait to get back on the dance floor. So you guys can hear me again, right? I'm good. I want, I want okay. to go dancing with George. Right? Me too. <laughs> so if the video works later on, I'll show you an alternative, but um, I just, uh, wow, right? 101. It's not what you would typically think. Granted, everybody's situation is different. Um, but for, for George, I mean, as long as somebody is motivated to do something or they have someone that they can borrow that belief in, in that time frame, um, it's incredible what you can do. So I will go back to a little bit about Fox. So who are we? I mean, I'm here today on, on behalf of Fox Rehabilitation. Um, our mission is to rehabilitate lives by believing in the strength of people. We believe in our people, allowing them autonomy to facilitate and provide clinically ex excellent care to our community with compassion and respect. Um, we also, our mission is to believe in our patients and their ability to achieve what they once thought was impossible and optimal function to rehabilitate their lives. So many people, when they start, um, when they hear about physical occupational therapy, rehab in general, they might not know exactly what that can be for them. And it is our mission to really get into what their goals are and then establish a plan of care. And whether I'm speaking about Fox or any rehab company, um, I always just say, do your due diligence, make sure that it's someone that has the clinical background and the expertise. So for us, we are 26 years young. Um, our founder and much of our leadership has a clinical background. And that's something I loved. I was a practicing occupational therapist for 10 years. Um, initially, I started in pediatrics, never thought I would work with it, adults. But what happens, right? Life. So a grandfather had a fall in a supermarket, shattered his humerus, needed occupational therapy down the line. I learned about it, ended up going to school for it. Um, but we make geriatric house calls. Um, so Howard had stated, you know, being a professional partner with those that treat in the same space is really pivotal, especially if it's someone that doesn't have um, a lot of resources or a lot of access because they're stuck in their home. What I will say with Fox, we make house calls wherever their environment is. So our patients actually do not have to be homebound. They can access the community. And we also treat in assisted living facilities across the nation. Um, just to give you scope, we're in about a dozen in Monmouth County, whether we're the, you know, provider, main provider in the building as a contracted uh, gym space, or we're a preferred provider. So it really is anywhere where someone is that, let's say they can't get to an outpatient facility, um, or they're just simply not going um, because it seems too big or too overwhelming, we're a nice option for them. And I want you to just think like, wow, the fact that somebody could get rehab in home it takes a lot of those hurdles out for someone in that time frame. Um, and again, I never say one is better than the other. If we have an individual that can eventually get to an outpatient facility, they have modalities that our clinicians just don't have. We can't bring a treadmill on our back, but you better believe we're bringing as much as we can in, let's say, a rolling suitcase where you're rolling you know, rehab. But our clinicians provide clinically excellent care to older adults in their home environment, believing in their strength and determination to achieve what once seemed impossible. Fox in general, another thing that has to be changed, I just learned on Monday, we're entering our 30th state in Kentucky. So we started in New Jersey. We, um, our home office is in Cherry Hill. We do not have physical locations. We go wherever the patients are, but we are consistently growing. And I think it just has speaks to the level of care that the patients and individuals we treat are receiving. Um, before I get into the 
indicators of each discipline, I think it's really important. I'm finding every day as an account manager, I constantly have to educate people on what, um, aside from private pay options, what insurance allows someone to get. And if somebody doesn't know what their um, you know, resources are or what access they have, a lot of times I'm finding that people just don't realize they have the option to have therapy, let's say after what um, Howard said, like if they're the first column, you'll see it says um, a home health agency. Most people I'll say in conversation, they know that they can get someone like for us, uh, visiting nurses or Meridian at home after let's say a big event, right? And a hospital discharge as Howard mentioned. So often they come in, they're the first line once someone enters the home in addition to whatever care um, such as home helpers and other agencies might come in to deliver, but it's limited. And I think that's the big point where I, when I sit on these calls and I hear the education piece from anyone that's speaking, those are the things like there's more out there. And I think if people don't know about it, they're just not taking advantage of it. And the whole purpose of rehab is to make sure that people are moving um, or engaging in these disciplines so that they can stay stronger longer. And if they only get 30 days of attention from a med agency, and then they're just left in their home environment, often they're still fearful. They're still not exactly where they can be, or sometimes not even functionally independent or at their max functional potential. And what ha happens? They move less, they do less. Aside from the physical component of what happens when someone sits in their chair for long periods of time, um, mental capacity changes too. Right. You don't I know I don't feel good when I don't move. I'm sure, you know, we get crabby or our whole, um, you know, outlook is different. And look at what happened during the pandemic. Right. Uh, we just our access changed. So when someone doesn't have the ability to do more and they haven't reached that potential, it's only natural that they feel less motivated to do so. So basically, all this is showing that there often there's Medicare A that will cover that first 30 days. And then we're that option in the middle. Um, we're a Medicare B provider. So individuals can get therapy sometimes up to three months if a clinician can justify a plan of care that addresses their goals and needs and they're continuing to participate. And then the other Med B would be the gray was the outpatient facility, typically what people think about when you think of rehab, going to a rehab facility. So our patients, um, average age is 83 years uh, old. They have about five chronic conditions, believe it or not, and a 10 is the average number of medications a FOX patient takes. So we all know that medication management as we age is a big part um, of, you know, what we can do and making sure that we're getting the care that we need and the appropriate medications, uh, that we can open them, that we know when to take them, all of these things. So aside from having caregivers that can assist with that in the home, our clinicians also work with somebody who has the capacity to, you know, restructure their environment so that they're successful in that way. But functional decline is not a normal part of aging. Yes, our bodies age, but we still have the capacity to do it in a better way. So it is reversible with a well-designed therapeutic program from a geriatrics expert. And many of our clinicians actually are, have additional certification. So it's nice because they know who they're treating. Um, therapists uh, that are going into a home or any environment can do some chronic condition management, vital sign monitoring, which is really huge. Some people only get their vital signs taken when they go to the doctor, right? But what's going on in the interim if nobody's there? Um, so our, our clinicians, um, a, a good, any clinician, a good clinician will walk in, they will take vital signs, make sure that somebody um, is number one, prepared to do the exercise or rehab they're about to partake in. And number two, that everything is where it should be. So it's an extra set of eyes. And that's what I say when I'm talking to a lot of our physicians. Um, you know, it's wonderful when they're in office, but what about when they're not? Referral screening. So if anything's going on that we need to refer out. Uh, that they need additional assistance or attention. And then of course, pain management, which is the reason why a lot of people go to rehab. Um, our clinicians are highly trained professionals that provide care at the top of their practice uh, to support the plans of care that they create for their patients. 
So this is really everything to me. Uh, strong and functional older adults, they will have increased independence. They will fall less. They are hospitalized less, as Howard mentioned, and they utilize fewer, fewer medical services. So properly dosed therapy across physical occupational speech therapy really makes older adults stronger and improves function. I think it's sad, and this is a, a part of why I say yes to these types of things to educate. People wait for a major event in order to be open to rehab, or there might not even be open. It's just, it's what needs to happen, right? Whereas any little change, whether it's, of course, if there's a new um, accommodation or equipment that is introduced into someone's life, a cane, a walker, things like that, that need to be changed in one's environment. But even regular deconditioning, um, breathing rate during activity, there are things that people notice changes. And e every one of us on this call can probably note a time when you notice something and you ignore it. Uh, and you ignore it and you ignore it until you're faced with something that comes up and you can no longer ignore it. But those little indicators, and especially if you're one that has a loved one or sees somebody, something as small from an OT background, I can say as someone having difficulty getting on their jacket, there's something going on that's not enabling them to be functional in that activity. It's an indicator for rehab. So um, even just having these conversations with people, oh, I noticed, you know, I'm seeing X, Y, and Z. We might want to just have a conversation or see like, maybe the doctor thinks this is warranted. Um, for our rehabilitation, you do need a script in order to initiate treatment, but you don't have to be, like I said, homebound and you don't need a face-to-face. -face. So it could just be a family member that's actually saying hey, I've noticed this. Why don't we bring it up at the next appointment? Or you can give them my number. We can have a conversation and I can contact the, the, the doctor. Um, but again, what I said before, Fox patients reduce medical costs. So I'm, I'm seeing all of these transitional programs that are, that are popping up, which I'm really glad to see in a lot of facilities um, that are following a patient post-hospitalization, um, looking into what's going on after. And we all know if someone has number one eyes on them and they're cared for, um, but if they're working on their strength and their mobility, they're going to combat some of the disease process. And again, that will re reduce uh, readmission rates. So I spoke to this a little bit before, but Fox can treat a patient after a home health episode to avoid rehospitalization. And that's really one of our main goals education wise, knowing that there's more out there. Uh, I will try this again. If it doesn't work, we'll just go on to the next. But I think it's important to show someone that is 78 is in their own private home and the power of a PT and an OT working with them. My name is Pat, and I am going to be. We hear it. We don't see it. Years old this year. Yeah, again. Uh, when I first met Pat, uh, she was um, having difficulty walking, especially on uneven surfaces. She definitely had a lot of balance issues. You could always tell when she was walking on the ground. There it goes. She went for the next solid surface right. to grab a hold. She had a lot of fear of falling. Um, and she just was tired. And you could just tell it took her a lot of effort to do things in the day, effort to get dressed stuff that shouldn't take a lot of effort. She was just very tired throughout the day. Before therapy, I was like a hermit. I went to work and came home and stayed home. I didn't go out. I was always afraid of what was going to be at the other end if I went somewhere, the grounds or steps or that kind of thing. So I went to work because it's on one level. And uh, no steps to get in the building, and then I would come home. Uh, Pat's goals were to be able to keep up with her family when they went on vacation. Um, she wanted to be able to go get it up and down the, the basement stairs. Uh, she wanted to be able to get in and out of the car without having to lift up her 
legs um, with arms. Our main goals for occupational therapy were a lot on um, just function, um, trying to get better throughout the day, trying to get stronger so it did, she wasn't so tired at the end of the day. We got stronger in the arms, we got our hand strength stronger, we got walking better, we got our balance better, just a little bit of everything to kind of just gain confidence in herself again. And I, I have confidence now that I'm not going to fall because that was a big issue. The confidence makes me feel great because I know I can do things now. I'm real excited for her. I'm excited for her every day that she made progress in, in every area. Um, I was excited for her um, ability to be able to interact with the environment and to get back in, out into the community and not feel so fearful. Seeing Pat reach her goals, it was just, it was a whirlwind. And every time you came into Pat's house, she was so welcoming. Even if she just had the worst day at work, she just made you feel at home. And knowing that she feels stronger and that she feels better and she feels more confident in herself is just a, the best reward you can have. I feel I've come a long way and I'm not so much a hermit anymore. <laughs> Like my daughter says, you're just an old couch potato. She said, why don't you get up and do something, go somewhere, whatever. Now she's saying, well, where are you going today? What are you doing today? So. All right, you're back on Pat, right? So you can, I hope you can appreciate the fact that there are people, I mean, to me, you think 78, working, living in their own home, um, there are a lot of people that are still not experiencing life as they should. And like I said, really like functional independence, not just being able to go from A to B, but actually experiencing life in the way that um, we were meant to. So um, it, she's just a good example of this. A lot of times um, we get people when they're down in this space as far as frailty uh, prior to failure, just because of, you know, the aging process or something significant that has happened. And our goal is always to get them back to this fun part, right? Because we all know that if we're experiencing things and we're not fearful and we're able to partake in um, activities, not just by ourselves, but with others or in our community, um, we're much more successful. So yes, we, we kind of span that route from frailty to function. And our goal is always to get back to that fun, regardless of what's happening. And the effects of age-related change in muscle strength, um, this is what it, it's showing. While there's normal age-related regression or weakness, exercise can offer a reversal of this weakness. Yes. And just-, and just Knowing, knowing that um, is really important. So again, so I, the flyer said the three disciplines. So I think it's really important when people think rehab, I still think many people just think of physical therapy and they probably think of, okay, my legs are weak. Uh, my balance and my gait has changed. Something needs to change, right? I need to get stronger um, and work on that. But Wow, uh, occupational therapy is extremely powerful, especially when uh, coupled with that physical therapy component. So yes, we can work on weakness and balance and endurance and flexibility and pain management, but a physical therapist's eyes might be on that gait pattern accessibility where somebody can get to the actual transfer. Whereas an occupational therapist scope is focusing on the activities that someone can partake in activities of daily living, instrumental activities of daily living. Um, like I said before, accessing the community, managing medication, home safety is huge, uh, and caregiver stress. We do a lot of caregiver training that is skilled, right? Assisting someone, showing them how to facilitate a transfer if there is somebody in there properly or with a set of clinical eyes to rearrange the environment so that everybody is more successful is very powerful as far as that scope. Um, but an occupational therapist will look at the activity. So whether bathing, dressing, making a meal, um, any of those things in order to be more successful. And then speech therapy. I think a lot of people just think of how one speaks. 
And right now I'm seeing a lot of referrals come in because people are starting, I think, to understand that there's a cognitive rehab piece that a speech therapist can work on. So yes, we work on swallowing. Yes, voicing, expressive language, receptive language, and intelligibility. But there is this whole space, especially for many of us on this call, when we first see like indicators that, you know, dementia is just starting or something's just starting to progress, there is absolutely reason that a speech therapist can come in and evaluate and establish a plan of care to help one um, maximize their functional independence while this uh, disease might be taking place. So knowing the three of them, I think is important. And then I'm just going to, instead of clicking on the link, I'm just going to show you guys. I know it's a lot of words, but understanding that something just like ambulation and balance, like I said, it's not just physical therapists that can work on this. The occupational therapist has a lot to do with the core strength and the posture, um, fatigue or shortness of breath and endurance is a really big one, right? When somebody has an event or something happens, like I said, just basic deconditioning to work on that endurance and um, ability to take on a heavier load, even if that's walking to the kitchen or walking to the bathroom. We all know when certain things get harder and we might need additional assistance. Transfers is a big one. If you can't get up from a chair, most likely you're going to stay there. And I know for me when treating in the homes, um, when I walked in and I saw that favorite chair with the indent that was almost down to the floor, it just showed me aside from having a favorite position to uh, watch TV in, that person is very rarely getting up from it. And what the disease process that goes on, I think long-term when someone's not moving, um, it can be avoided. So making sure that even something as little as if you're watching TV and you're a couch potato, like Pat said, every commercial scoot forward. It means you have to get up and move and scoot forward and move your body. So little things that people can work in or having a box that has, you know, equipment, whether it's a weight or a can or a water bottle that says I'm going to use this in a home exercise program. Things that individuals can do when a therapist isn't there, um, because we all know it. It's not just the two, three times a week that a clinician is in the room that matters. It's that carryover. Um, and then, like I said before, caregiver education, huge. Um, often there's someone that either if they haven't hired somebody that is, you know, an expert, they're um, often they're doing it themselves and they don't even know where to start. So making sure that we can arm them with the resources, set them up so that they can safely uh, assist, whether it's physical transfers or set up an environment so that that person can be more successful. 85% um, of Fox patients are treated by one dedicated clinician during their entire plan of care. Now, again, I told you we're in just now 30 states. I will tell you almost every single patient that comes to us has one physical therapist in their plan of care and one occupational therapist unless there's a week that they're away. Uh, this is really important to me too. I think when you're recommending people, um, consistency, something might happen on Monday. If it's the same person coming in on a Wednesday and a Friday, they'll catch those little things. They don't have to take part of a session to go through history and go through all this stuff because they know exactly you, they know the patient. Right. So understanding that that person is well equipped to do the work that needs to be done, I think, is really important. And then 97% um, is the percent of Fox patients who would recommend Fox geriatric therapy at home to friends and relatives. So uh, we just so we have a really good success rate. Um, we don't take it lightly that we go into people's homes, uh, whether that be in a building or whether that be in a private residence. Um, this is someone's space, you know, and I know for the sake of time, I won't show one more. Maybe I'll share it in our group just because Janet is awesome. Um, but she went from, you know, having to rely on all these things bed bound in a hospital and ended up throwing the cane in the air and walking all the way to the dining room uh, when she never thought that would be, you know, something that she could do. So I think we, um, we're grateful that we get to be a part of individual stories. I think I, the part that uh, saddens me sometimes is that people just don't know 
And time is of the essence for a lot of these patients and individuals that are in their environment. So if they don't know that they can get more or they can start with somebody and yes, we have private pay, but if it's covered a hundred percent to me, it's like a no brainer. And I, it's sad for me when I find out that someone had no idea that they had a resource out there. Um, and that's again, why I think even with Howard uh, speaking before I get on these calls so that I can give people resources. You know, I want to give them value. I want them to know what's available for them out there. So um, I hope I gave you a little insight as far as the disciplines. Um, obviously, if you ever need anything in the therapy space, please call, even if it's just a question, uh, to, you know, um, but I'll leave it open to questions, Howard. Yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely. And thank, thanks, Lorley. I think you know, in the seeing George, right? I think the first thing that came to me is the feeling, right? There's a certain feeling that you only a caregiver can get when they are taking care of someone who is actually being successful, right? And one of the reasons why our partnership is so important is for all the reasons that you stated today, right? When you think about, um, what a typical profile is. And I, I took some notes on what you said, 83, five chronic conditions and 10 meds. That is a classic example of someone that cannot be fully, usually not be fully independent. I don't want to say in all cases, but they need some, some level of assistance. And physical and occupational therapy is something that a person like that 100% can benefit from. And I know that these are qualified expenses for insurance, right? Whereas a service like mine is a, pro is a private out-of-pocket expense. Not everyone can do have that. That's, that is a little bit of a luxury. But when it comes to PT and OT, it, it is an important part of the rehabilitation process. And actually, you know, I argue that that's probably one of the most important aspects when you're out of that direct care situation right? Whether you're in a facility or even if it's an outpatient, right? Like that is super, super important. So seeing the success stories, seeing George for me is just the feeling that I get every time because I have, you know, 35 Georges, right? And I'm very fortunate that, you know, my clientele uh, gets the assist. From, and I, the other thing that I noticed was I think it was Joy at the end when she uh, was going into the car. There was an aide there that was assisting her, right? So that's where the continuity, right, comes into play. The continuity of care uh, is always so important. So that so much of this resonated for me. But let's open it up to the to the group for some questions. I, I we're running short on time. We don't have a large group today, so I think we can get through it. But I would like to open it up to the group for some questions. So if anyone has a question um, for uh, Laura Lee, let's hear it. <laughs> Any questions? I have a question. Yeah. Um, hi, so my name is Rebecca. I work uh, with Brandywine and Shrewsbury. I would love if you, if possible, if you could send the one slide with the comparison of like the home health provider and then you guys. And then um, I don't even remember what the third slide was because oftentimes, and even myself, and I'm sure Howard too, because I'm primarily private pay or long-term care insurance, like the Medicare part A, part B. And this isn't like my first rodeo in healthcare. And to this day, I'm like, who knows? Like yeah, just- That like Medicare maze I use literally multiple times a day. And this is often people like yourself or physicians, people that are in this healthcare space. So you can imagine, I liken insurance to a telephone bill. We're yeah. now not supposed to understand it, yeah. right? And yeah. then if, if, if we on this call don't understand it, if I we know. can't understand <laughs> it for our loved ones and they yeah. don't even have access to Google and God knows what, um, I just think, yes, it's a, it's a great piece. I will absolutely share it. And I just want to share Brandywine has a special place in my heart. I know they have their own therapy providers, but when I started with Fox, I was half in the community and half at uh, Brandywine and Howell. And thank I love you. I love started at Brandywine and Howell. So I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. And this was great. So thanks. Okay. I'm glad. Awesome. Um, thanks, Rebecca. 
Anybody um, else with a question? I do. Really great presentation. So um, where would one start? They have to be evaluated first for you to be able to go in their home to see where they are. Because I, I just thinking of a woman that is very active, 86, still works, drives, looks like she's 70, and just had a fall and fractured her hip in two places. So like in, for a situation like that, um, there was no sign of something happening, but for people that are active and they're starting to slow down in their eighties, like yeah. how does one prevent something like that? She didn't need any care until now. Right. But she was starting to slow down. I saw it about 84. Yeah. But how would one be able to prevent such a, um, devastation for someone that's not used to even just have been a fractured hip. She had a hard time staying still because sure. she's a powerhouse. So sure. So, no, but, she's, she's amazing. And she's probably the reason why we're going into all, and we're seeing more referrals from 55 and olders. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are people who are active within their community, but mm -hmm. let's be real because people are more active, myself included, I'm a 6am gym person, but the amount of knees and hips and, and things that are going on in these days, people are going to need assistance. Now, granted, you said she slowed down at 84. I'd be curious to know what little things even though it's not because we could like to compare to like the person that I said that 83 with five core morbidities what well, little it's, thing well instead of working full-time COVID part stopped part of her business but um because she's a public speaker in the um, in the um in the industry of um education all right mm -hmm. she's like this this big wig she's been on tv and all over the place and um so my question is just in general how does one move on from that and then also i know many people that are still active in their 80s and 90s driving yeah. but you know just to to, to, to maybe prevent like to, in other words to keep them moving maybe yeah. there's no sign and they're still but they're, they're slowing down means they take longer to maybe walk to the sink so that's they, it so yeah, that's it. Right. That's the conversation. To be honest, that's what I, I meant by saying it doesn't need to be this major event. A okay, little bit you. less, less mobility, should, you know, more time at home. Things are getting a little harder right there. She can give me a call and I can call them. I can send the facts out or request to physicians. Most people who see an 86 year old person, as long as they've been seen within a year and they're up to date on their care, they will sign off for these rehabs. And it's Perfect. our job as a clinician, we'll go in once I get everything and connect with her and get all, you know, insurance, taking care of all that. Um, it's the clinician's job that will go in that can establish a plan of care based on that person's goals. If for any reason we felt we couldn't justify being in that home, naturally we wouldn't continue. But it's those little things. And I think that's so important um, that, you know, I just don't feel like I'm doing this as successfully is enough to initiate rehab. Because how else do you continue to build up the strength or get back to where maybe you were or continue to prevent what's coming? Um, so yeah, really, really important. And then the, the flip side of that, I would say like anybody that you know that's getting, I have a lot of people that are, maybe they are on their own or they don't have access to a caregiver like Howard yet, but they have a scheduled hip or knee or surgery coming up. They know for maybe it's a short plan of care for us, but I just, just a woman the other day, she's going to be having a scheduled surgery. We're going to go in for a month and then she's going to go back to out, but she's going to go to outpatient because she can finally drive herself there. So sometimes it's the concierge part of it. It's the, the, you know, the, just the ac accessibility if somebody can't get there. We have some, you know, physicians that operate on shoulders. They always send the referral initially because someone can't drive. So after that, it's our job to discharge accordingly so that they can then transition to an outpatient facility. Um, so it's, it's a good yeah. point. I think there's two things that I, I want to say there. I mean, the driving component in anyone who's 85 and older always scares me because there's it's more it, there's it's multidimensional. Right. It's not just the physical ability. It's the cognitive ability as well. So we really have to be cautious about our drivers. Um, and there are there are a number of public uh, screeners, self-screening, self-evaluation tools. AARP has one, AAA has one. I really encourage people to use those because the worst thing that can happen is God forbid an accident, they hurt themselves or they hurt someone else. So driving is something that I think we have to be super vigilant about, especially when we get you know into our, deep into our golden years. Um, that's one thing. I think the other thing that I want to mention as well, and then we'll wrap it up for today, and I think Laura, we did an amazing job, um, is 
on the short-term rehab also, right? Because we do the same, right? So a recuperative uh, program, short-term, whether they're doing the hip, the shoulder, the knee, whatever it is, a foot, um, anything like that, where there's gonna be limited mobility, especially if they are alone in the home, right? A short-term rehabilitation program. So someone to give them the support that they need, even if it's just something simple, like, you know, going to the grocery store, helping them to the appointment. So, you know, one or uh, two days a week or three days a week in support of a PTOT program, that's how they get back to their independence quickly and safely. And I want to underscore the safety part as well, right? Because the, 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 the therapist is going to be there helping them build that confidence, build that strength, ensure the mobility is there, making sure that they're able to do their ADLs and IDF, ADLs. And then that aid will be there for the rest of the time, right, in those gaps where they have some additional needs. So I think that's where the additional safety comes in. But those things are available. And yes, it's about education. So this is where we kind of tie it all together. And I love that we have a bunch of different types of healthcare providers on today's call, like my friends at Brandywine, right? Where we all work together, right? And I, and I didn't know that Laura Lee started at Howell Brandywine and got to store that one for the next time we have a conversation. But yeah, that that's how it works, okay? And this is how the chamber works, right? So opportunities like this to speak, to educate, to ask questions is, is what this is all about. So I would like to thank uh, Laura Lee, you know, great partnership. Um, Fox is a great company. And again, you know, for me, the testimonial here is about the outcomes, right? Because we've had numerous referrals and those folks have gone through the program and have come out better for it, which is why I always recommend it. So thanks, Laura Lee. Appreciate you coming on and being a great guest and, of course, um, being a great partner here. So we're going to go down.